Professor Kornick is uh, the best of the best. And in an area that I like very much, which I also, uh, along with revenue management, I specialize with which is services marketing. And he's done a lot of, of research, which uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, more about what you are doing right now. Uh, he has a lot of experience also in, in the cruise industry, in tourism, and uh, in social media marketing, and, and also the all, all the experience design and experience marketing. Is that right? That's correct. Perfect. Yes. So, so it's quite an honor to have you here. Uh, I might say that you were uh, one of my best professors, my, my best teachers I've ever had. So I'm very, very glad. And this is very special for me to have uh, you with us here. Thank you very much for sharing uh, a little bit of your knowledge and your time with our students. Of course. Well, and Damien, thank you so much for that, that introduction. It's great to see everyone. I, I haven't been Zoom teaching so far this, uh, this semester. We are back full in person at Cornell, um, but everyone's wearing masks, so I can't see any faces. I actually like this better because I can see you. Uh, most of my students now I can only see their eyes, which is, uh, I, I like to know students' names, and it's very difficult when you can only see somebody's eyes. So it's nice to see uh, all of your faces. And I'm thrilled to be here with you. Um, I've just been told that if I don't make it to Ecuador and to the Galapagos within the next year, um, some of your professors are going to come find me and they're going to drag me from New York to come. Absolutely. Visit. No, I, actually, uh, the second <laughs> week of January, uh, it's either the second or the third. I, I'm, I'm getting the dates uh, uh, settled up, but uh, you have to come here. So please uh, book something and, and get your, <laughs> uh, get, get those dates in your calendar because uh, <laughs> you have to come here. Sounds like a, like a good hospitality marketer. <laughs> Thank you, Damien. And by the way, in New York in January, it's absolutely miserable. So you don't have to, that, that's an invitation I'll accept. Um, again, I'm very happy to be with you. I, I've been at Cornell about 20 years now, and I have a hospitality background. So, you know, I look at all of you, and, and when I, I started, um, actually, I grew up in hospitality. So I'm very, very passionate about it. And I think to to enjoy the classes that you're taking and the industry that you're in, you have to just feel a passion for it. Um, and it's becoming much more professional and much more scientific, but you still need to love people and love the destinations and, and love the experiences that you're creating. Um, my, my mother was a travel agent and my father spent his entire career in the leisure cruise industry. So he did sales and marketing for the Cunard line way back in the 1950s and 1960s. And then he did uh, sales uh, training programs for an, a, an organization called Cruise Lines International Association, which is the big trade association that represents about 100 cruise lines around the world. So when I had the opportunity to come to Cornell and study and, and, and teach hospitality marketing and then you know, the dean at Cornell said, well, if you have a background in the cruise industry, by all means, make that something you want to study. Uh, it couldn't have fit better. And so uh, that's an area that I study a lot is, is the cruise industry, as well as uh, digital marketing and social media, which are two areas that I do a lot of work in now, mostly with my former students. So I have former students who have graduated and created social media agencies. And uh, now I do research with them because it's pretty hard to keep up with what's going on in social media. So what I wanna do with the time that we have is I'm gonna talk a little about, um, just about how marketing has, has evolved during the past 18 months, right? During the pandemic. And we're gonna look at that through the lens of the cruise industry. And I don't know if how many of you have been on cruises before, but you wanna talk about an industry that absolutely got hammered by the pandemic, right? It just literally was shut down for the better part of a year. And you would think that that means that there was no marketing that was done, right? If you're not selling cruises, how could you actually do marketing? And I think what you'll find in this little conversation we have is that is actually they did probably even more marketing, but it wasn't the kind of marketing you would think about. It wasn't like marketing communications where you're selling cruises or you're promoting or you're doing social media. 
it was a different kind of marketing. It was how do we, we identify uh, the right markets that want to take cruises? How do we now sell the product to people given that we have so many concerns about the pandemic? How do we change our website so it's not talking about how wonderful cruises are, but instead helps customers feel safer and more secure, right? How do we change the product? Because when you think about marketing, it's not always just advertising and selling, right? It's also product development and it's also marketing research. So I'm gonna walk us through a little discussion of that. And then uh, if you have any questions along the way, please post in the chat, raise your hand. Otherwise, um, I'm happy to take your questions at the end. So I'm gonna do a share screen, bring up my deck. And I'm gonna jump right in. So the topic loosely is how do you do marketing in uncertain times, right? How do you handle marketing when you're faced with something like the pandemic and the entire world is changing around you? And again, we're gonna look at it through the lens of the global cruise industry. And I don't think any of this is a surprise to any of you who are studying hospitality. The 2020 into 2021 has just been an awful year for our industry. Um, this chart shows occupancies, occupancy rates at hotels in the United States. And you can see how things were moving along just great in 2019 and then everything just plummeted. And there was a nice bounce back, right? You look at here, we sort of see a little bit of a bounce back, but then with concerns about the Delta variant, um, occupancy rates have started to fall again. So it was just a difficult year. But if you wanna talk about an industry that had a really difficult time, it was the cruise industry. This is actually a satellite picture on the right of all these cruise ships um, off the coast of the UK. They're also off the coast of South America and Africa. They were also off the coast of, uh, of Florida and the United States that were just anchored or sailing around in circles without passengers. And so the entire industry had to shut down. To give you an example, I had February, of 2020, end of February, I had 30 students on a three-day cruise out of Florida for a course that I teach on the cruise industry. Now, if you remember the timing of that, that was the end of February. Within three weeks, the industry had virtually shut down. So in the United States, at least, we didn't, or, or North America and South America, we didn't see the pandemic yet as a big problem. It was all happening in China, right? And Interestingly, outside of China, once the pandemic really hit, it was on a Princess Cruises ship. And at that time, that particular ship had more COVID cases than almost every country, except for China, right? So the cruise industry just took it right across the chin with uh, just bad publicity. And so it was a really difficult time. But you look at this as an industry that has had to find a way to bounce back. And currently about 50% of the world's ships are back on the ocean, they're back sailing, but they're sailing at significantly reduced occupancies. So they're sailing at about half full. And this is an industry, when you think about uh, revenue management that would usually sail at over 100% occupancy. So the idea is that you've actually got people like families where in a cabin, you have two people, maybe two kids. So that would count as over 100% occupancy. But still, it's an industry that is uh, significantly in debt and trying to bounce back. There is, though, in this industry, a lot of room for optimism. And so I want to just touch on a few of these things before we do a little, a little case study looking at one of the cruise lines. The industry is looking at this saying, all right, we've... We have protocols in place, a lot of protocols in place to try to create a healthy and safe experience for consumers. Um, there's this global savings pool. So people have been saving money, right? They haven't been able to travel. So there's this, this pent up demand and this, um, this excess savings and people are eager to travel again. The other thing is this idea is travel is resilient. And I'll show you a chart that shows even after uh, various economic or natural shocks, we call like uh, disasters, travel bounces back. And it often bounces back very quickly. 
And as an industry, and this speaks to your university and other universities that teach hospitality, we learn and we adapt. We learn how to innovate. We learn how to deal with that adversity and say, what are we going to do different? How can we adapt to this and maybe take some of these innovations and carry them forward? And I've got great examples of this from the cruise industry. And I think very interesting, especially for a destination like the Galapagos, there's this belief, and we hope it's true, that travelers of the future, near future, are going to be very different. They're going to be much more aware of the world around them. They're going to be much more um, aware of sustainability because this experience has been hard for people, and I'm sure it's been hard for you. So let's think about some examples, right? We, you've, I'm sure, been to hotels and restaurants. We've got all the protocols in place, you know, where we're still wearing, wearing masks and we're still sanitizing. So all of these things are in place, right? So we're ready. This chart shows this spike in consumer savings, which is pretty astonishing. So this is looking at a couple of different uh, countries, US, UK, Japan, and then the Eurozone, where you see, you know, savings had been relatively flat. For example, in the US, it had been hovering below 10%, people not spending their money. And then it just, when COVID hit, we couldn't spend our money. We couldn't go out to restaurants, we couldn't travel. So this is a great thing for our industry, because our industry is one that's based on disposable income, right, the people that want to travel. Now you start to see that, that inflection point and where the savings rate starts to drop. And part of that is because of unemployment, right? People then all of a sudden were losing their jobs. So, you know, the savings rate now, it's, it's come back down because of people that are concerned about their jobs or who lost their jobs. But what we certainly know is that there is considerable pent up demand and people who want to spend their money. This is some data from Royal Caribbean uh, International, which is a, a cruise line that I do a lot of work with. And it's pretty amazing. What this is showing is cruise bookings. Now, you would think that given all the bad press that the cruise industry has had, that people would be very reluctant to book. But what this is showing is when you start looking at 2021, that bookings are taking off people are ready to get back to vacationing. And these are bookings for, this is for the year. So this is the, when they say it's the 2021 deployment, these are for cruises for later this year. And people are booking those cruises despite all of the uncertainty. And it's because people still wanna travel. And it's this idea travel is resilient. What this is showing is how travel dropped off, again, across different areas after more significant, what we'll call shocks, economic shocks. So this was after the 9-11 attacks that happened in the US and you see travel dropped, right? Because people were concerned about traveling and staying in hotels and getting in airlines, but it didn't take long. Within a couple of years, it bounced back to the previous level. There was a big recession in 2009 across the world and we see again that travel dropped, but it didn't take long within a year or two travel bounce back. So the pattern is one that suggests that despite what we're all going through and what our industry is going through, the travel is resilient. It's gonna bounce back, right? Travel, hospitality, dining out experiences are things that are just essential for people, especially for people with the disposable income. And then there's this idea that, you know, in your classes and certainly in, in maybe some internships that you have, you see how Companies in hospitality have learned to adapt. So take restaurants, for example. If all of a sudden you can't have people dining in, you, you shut the doors. Some had to. Others adapted. Others said, we're going to jump into, we're going to create our own mobile app, or we're going to work with companies that have mobile delivery services, and we're going to pivot. We're going to become a complete takeout or takeaway restaurant. And a lot of hotel restaurants even did that. They said, okay, if we've, we've got these restaurants in our hotel, we may not have guests here, but we can still feed the community. We can function just like a restaurant 
but we happen to be a restaurant within a hotel. Or if it's even buffet dining, which is big um, in a lot of areas and certainly in cruising, well, we don't want people touching food. So what do we do? We make sure we still allow for buffet, but now we have service staff that are serving people, right? So, or if it's cashless payment systems, right? The industry has learned to adapt and will continue to do so, right? And a lot of that has been just through innovation. So we'll talk about what some of those are. Now, it may be too early to tell, and some of you may have already been starting to see this, but we hope, we hope we're going to see a new kind of traveler, right? So we're going to see somebody that's more socially conscious. And I see this a lot with younger travelers, you know, people like you who are very aware of the environment, are very aware of their impact, and very aware of how our behaviors as travelers impacts another. So wearing masks, partly to protect ourselves, but also to protect others. And thinking about our choices, um, about how we spend our money or about how we use energy, right? And how it might impact others. And we hope that one of the positives that will come out of this pandemic is that people are much more aware of how what they do impacts others. We're also probably gonna see for the, at least the near future, much more cautious traveling. Like people that are traveling, but they're, they wanna know what are the health and safety protocols that are in place? You know, are you gonna protect me as a traveler? Are you gonna make sure that everyone who is getting on that airplane or staying at that hotel is abiding by health and safety standards? Right. We're also seeing a more flexible traveler. And that's because so much of our travel has been canceled. You know, if you had flights booked and all of a sudden borders were closed or you had a cruise booked and the cruise line had to stop, we had to take a deep breath and say, okay, all right, I have to be more flexible with my travel arrangements, right? I understand that things happen. I understand that suddenly a border closes and my plans have to change. So what used to be maybe a much more rigid traveler saying, I want to be up there at this time and my flight's late and you've got to get me there on time is maybe a traveler that's going to be much more understanding. And I think the big one is that we hope that we're going to have more travelers who return now during the pandemic, but even post pandemic, who just appreciate what you do, right? The industry that you're going into, who haven't been able to experience hospitality over the last couple of years and who are gonna appreciate dining out again and appreciate staying at hotels and appreciate the experiences that you create. Fingers crossed, right? That's what we're hoping, that that's what we're gonna see. So what does this mean when you start thinking about marketing, right? One of the first things is understanding how travel behavior has changed. So a lot of the research I'm seeing now shows that travelers want to see that you're gonna take care of them. They wanna see these visible signs. I was just talking to a general manager of a hotel who said that um, they're still doing the thermal uh, temperature checks as soon as you walk into the lobby. And this is, a, this is a, a luxury hotel. They are doing temperature checks for everybody still. And they found that actually guests really like that. It's, it's a sign, it's right, it's a signal that says, we understand that you're still worried and we have protocols in place to help take care of you. There's also this requirement, if, if travelers have to be more flexible in our planning, companies have to be more flexible in taking care of customers. So for example, in the cruise industry, it used to be that if you canceled your cruise within like 30 days of the sailing, you would, leave, you would lose maybe 75, if not 100% of your deposit. You would lose it, right? It was the one way that the cruise lines managed their pricing was to have this cancellation policy. And we may find that that cancellation policy will never happen again because the cruise lines realized that in order to get bookings, they needed to reduce the risk of purchase. So they instituted many of them this 48 hour cancellation policy saying you could cancel up to two days before your cruise and you would either get your money back or you would get a credit for a future cruise. 
This is a huge change. And it's recognizing that, first of all, you don't want show, somebody showing up at the, at the port who might be sick, right? And who's worried that they might lose their deposit if they don't show up. But it's also that just with everything that's changing and make travel becoming more difficult, people need that flexibility. But it does mean too that revenue management systems are going to have to really be different in industries that relied on, can't, right? So, what have we learned? One of the things is in certain industries is, and I, I, I quote Winston Churchill: "Never let a good crisis go to waste." Right? Is is how can we figure out how to make our hospital hospitality services better? given this pandemic. And then the pandemic in a weird way gave us a time, an opportunity, because we didn't have, you know, customers to say, all right, let's make some changes. Like this is the, Damien probably recognizes this, the Statler Hotel at Cornell, um, Cornell's campus, and it became a quarantine center. All right, we didn't have any guests. So we said, okay, we're going to use this to be uh, a quarantine facility for students. And what would we have to do differently in order to provide that kind of service? So let's talk about Royal Caribbean. And let me explain first, I have a, um, a, a number of former students that I've been able to get jobs at Royal Caribbean. And um, the senior vice president of hotel operations there is a graduate of the Cornell Hotel School and become a good friend of mine. And he's helped, he's helped me create a, a course that I teach. We are teaching, it's now in its seventh year. And so a lot of this information comes from him. His name is Mark Tamas. And you have to imagine an industry that went from expecting to have 32 million passengers in 2020 to having almost none, right? It just, and that's because across the globe, but certainly in North America, which is the biggest cruise market, the Center for Disease Control halted cruising, said it's no cruising until we can find a way to make sure that it's safe. This gave the industry this unusual opportunity to use that time to think about innovating. You know, and a lot of it was how can we innovate the product so that we can get back to cruising? But as you'll see, some of these innovations are things that actually post pandemic, which we hope we'll see soon, actually become something that will make the cruise experience better down the road. So just looking at what happened to this industry, and here's one, one company, right? So Royal, it's the actual Royal Caribbean group. So they have a several brands. They have Royal Caribbean, they've got Celebrity, uh, Silver Seas, which is a high-end brand. They had to cancel just under 3,000 voyages on just under 3 million bookings. And one of the crazy things they had to do was they had to get 47,000 crew members from around the world back home. And this was during a time when many of the airports had closed. So they were actually using the cruise ships to get their crew back home. So this was an enormous operational challenge and a significant financial challenge as well. But they are noted, this is a brand that has staked, so in particular, Royal Caribbean itself on being innovative. So they said, if this is who we are as a brand, an innovative company, we have to continue to innovate. So Royal Caribbean is one of the brands that put things like ice skating rinks on board ships and zip lines and surf machines. And, you know, they're really big on innovating the customer experience. And so they put their team in charge of that and said, let's think of how we can innovate in a way that will help us deal with this pandemic and getting people, getting our, our ships back at sea. So sometimes they took a very structured approach. So we've got to look at our enhancing our, um, our onboard protocols and processes. So if any of you have been on a cruise, you may um, have seen that, and this goes back 20 years, by the way, cruises were known for putting hand sanitizers outside of restaurants 20 years ago right before, well before COVID. And that was because of another illness called, called norovirus, which is basically like a stomach bug, stomach flu. So you might have a passenger that comes on board that's got a stomach bug, and then they touch a hand railing or they touch an elevator button. And because it's an enclosed environment on a cruise ship, 
that kind of virus can be transmitted quickly. So the cruise industry had always had enhanced safety and health protocols, but the pandemic required them to make these, you know, to enhance these significantly. And then to think about testing, and then to think about processes for physical distancing, and also to think about just uh, housekeeping. How can we keep things cleaner? And maybe have some of these things be become the new policies and procedures that the industry is going to use. They also had to start by doing tests. I actually just spoke with a, a former student today who is works for Royal Caribbean, and she's uh, involved with some of the simulation cruises they're doing. And that's because the Center for Disease Control said, we're not going to let cruise ships sailing out of the United States go at full capacity without running simulations. So test cruises with much, much smaller occupancies. Um, many of the people are like friends and family of employees, you know, so not necessarily paying guests yet. And they're testing all of the protocols, cleaning, what if somebody got sick, can we make sure that we get them off the ship and they won't expose other people, right? And so they started this in Singapore, one of the first times they, uh, this brand was able to bring cruising back in early 2021. And these are some of the things that they did. You know, cruise ships, which usually sail at 100% occupancy, we're doing it at half, right? Changing some of the ways in which the guests can interact on board. And this is tough. This is not what cruising is really all about. You know, even things like closing the bars at 1030. Right, cruise ships, usually the bars stay open pretty late and people have a good time, but they realize they have to introduce uh, new procedures to make sure that it's safe to go back. Another is looking at where you have assets that you can use. So one of the surprising positives to come out of the pandemic for at least Royal Caribbean, but other brands, uh, Disney, Norwegian Cruise Lines is another one, was that many of these brands have private islands around the world, right? So they've got some uh, in uh, the Pacific region, they've got some in the Caribbean, all right, they have some like near uh, Haiti and these private islands, like this is an example of the one that uh, Royal Caribbean has in the Bahamas, which they built this amazing massive water park on there. And it's a regular stop on, it's a regular port of call on Royal Caribbean cruises. But you can imagine what this might be useful for. And one of the things they found was that they could get back to cruising quicker if they only visited this private island because everything on the island, the company controls. The employees are Royal Caribbean employees. All the food on the island that's served to guests comes off the ships, right? So as opposed to going in a port of call where you're interacting with the local community, which is of course what people want, but then you're introducing the possibility of um, of disease transmission. But here it's like this environmental bubble, right? You can stop at this private island and better guarantee, I shouldn't say guarantee, but better ensure that your, your crew and your passengers are going to be safe. You have this environmental bubble. So the, uh, the chairman of Royal Caribbean said, we had never thought in a, in a million years that this private island would be something that might be the saving grace for uh, the, the company, that we could at least sail to this private island and make it a key part of our itinerary. Another one is working with competitors. So Royal Caribbean and Norwegian Cruise Lines, two fierce competitors, actually banded together with their executives and they created this healthy sail panel. And by the way, this is marketing. This is like, it's not the marketing you would think about about, okay, advertising or something we're gonna put on a website. But they said, we need as an industry to work together to develop new protocols to make sure our customers are gonna be safe and to then promote these to the Center for Disease Control so that they may eventually say, okay, the industry is ready to start cruising again. So when you see fierce competitors band together, Right, and say, we now are gonna to work together to, 
to come up with all these different areas. So they came up with 74 recommendations, you know, how to prevent um, virus transmission. If there is any on board, how do you mitigate it, right? How do you make sure that people are safe? How do you mobilize? How do you get people off the ships, right? So these, these two competitors work together to create this healthy sail panel, and then they promoted it, right? It became part of a PR, a public relations campaign that the industry sent out saying, look at what we're doing to try to ensure safety for the industry, and we're working together to do that. That's an amazing innovation in terms of marketing to have these two companies band together. And sometimes it can be something really, really simple. This was a just a great idea that a crew member on the Quantum of the Seas, which was the ship that started sailing in Singapore, said, you know what? If we have to wear masks, our customers, our guests can't see us smile. And providing friendly service, passionate friendly service is part of who we are. So they came up with this idea of smile buttons. And so you can see this guy has a button here on his, on his, on his uh, sport coat. That's his actual face with a smile on it, right? Just to try to show guests saying, you know, we, we're still smiling here when we're serving you. So even something as simple as that, that's marketing. It's operations, but it's marketing. And it's a great idea that actually came from a crew member. Here's another great example. This is marketing. So if you've been on a cruise, you know that at the very beginning of a voyage, all the passengers have to attend a lifeboat drill, or what's called a safety of life at sea drill. So you know where in the event of emergency, you go to get a lifeboat. It's, it's also called the muster drill. And muster is a word for to gather together. So you would have to gather everybody together at your lifeboat station, right? You can imagine that's not exactly great for social distancing. And it's also something that cruise passengers don't really enjoy, right? You've already, you just got on board the ship. You're in your bathing suit. You've got beers in both hands. You're ready to have a good time. And you hear the ship's horn that says you have to go do the safety drill. And you have to stand, right, for 45 minutes or whatever it might be until everybody gathers. What Royal Caribbean did is they came up with a, an app version of this. So it's a way using geolocation on your phone. You can watch, read the instructions for the safety drill, and then you go to where your lifeboat is, and you can check in to say, I, I know where my lifeboat is. I've completed the drill, and there's no concerns about having clusters of people together. But it also solves a problem that was this was a pain point in the cruise experience. So with this being implemented, it means that in future cruises, when you're not worried about the pandemic, this will be used and it's gonna make the cruise experience better. This is actually an innovation that Royal Caribbean shared with their competitors and said, look, this is gonna be better for all of us. Another example of how you innovate during times of crisis, Royal Caribbean had these things that are called wow bands, right? So they're basically, it's a, uh, a QR code, right? On a bracelet or some people would have them on like a necklace. And it creates a, a payment system, a cashless payment system. So you could just swipe that. You know, if you go to the bar, you swipe it when you order a drink. You could use it to um, open up your cabin or your room. And they were starting to implement this on their ships. And then they realized the other benefit of it is you can actually trace where people, it's look kind of a little scary if you think about it, but you could trace where people are on the ship. So if I was in a lounge, getting something to eat and something to drink, and somebody in that lounge that was discovered that they had COVID, right, that they were sick, these bracelets could actually identify who was within 15 feet or whatever it might be of somebody who was sick. So it's a form of contact tracing. They never knew that, they didn't even think that it could be used for that, but instead it's something that through this innovation, they realized that it can also be used to help with the safety and the health of their passengers. So what we're also seeing is that these kind of innovations are being fast-tracked, right? Let's get these things so that the industry and the cruise industry, but also the hotel industry is 
is uh, implementing them sooner. You know, many of you probably have used your phones, right, for mobile check-in on, you know, for airplanes or for hotels. And that's something the cruise industry has done. But the benefit of that is it's contactless. I don't have to take my credit card out. I don't have to sign something. I don't have to touch paper, right, where there's a chance of transmitting a virus. It's something where I can just walk through. I hold it up, right, and I can board the ship without actually having to touch something. They do have the technology to do this purely with facial recognition now where I would upload a, a picture of my, my passport, maybe a picture of myself, all of my information. And then using cameras, I could just walk right on the ship. It identifies me. Um, it will then activate on my phone, my room key, my ability to pay, right? And so the idea is to have a, a truly contactless experience. What I like about it too, and this, this comes from the senior vice president of operations who said the other benefit is it gets people on board the ship faster, which means they can get to the bars faster, which means it can drive revenue. So they, you know, their, their joke is that if this system works well, you can go from the car to the bar in 10 minutes and already be enjoying your vacation. But it's an example of innovations that really became important during the pandemic when we worried about things like social distancing, we worried about things like uh, physical contact. And yet it might be something that also improves the guest experience down the road. Marketing has to be dynamic during a pandemic. This ship was built for China, right? It was designed for China. And it was a big announcement saying this brand new ship is gonna serve the Chinese market. Well, guess what? Royal Caribbean, Caribbean just made a decision a couple of weeks ago to pull it from China. It's going to sail out of the U.S. Now, the nice thing about cruise is you have a movable asset, right? So it's not like you build a resort somewhere and you can't just lift up the building, right? The cruise ship, you can move. But because there's still concerns about what's happening in China and political concerns too, they decided, okay, we need to have a different source market. So the idea here is that even in marketing and choosing your customers, you have to be dynamic. You have to be nimble. So one of the things that the industry has realized is that getting new cruisers on board ships is going to be a challenge. Right? If any of you have not been on a cruise before, you might be thinking, yeah, there's no way in the world you're going to get me on a cruise given you know, all the things that have happened due to COVID-19. And the industry knows that. It's going to take a lot more effort to get people to be ready to go on cruises. So what uh, the industry is doing right now is focusing a lot of their marketing on repeat cruisers, trying to get repeaters to come back because repeat cruisers understand the product, right? And they understand safety and they understand what the cruise industry does to keep things clean and safe. So, Instead of saying we want to build a market of new cruisers, we're going to focus there, right, with our, our social media or advertising. They're saying we're going to direct all of our marketing or much of it to our repeat cruiser database. We're going to message out to them and try to get them to come back, right? So marketing had to be really nimble in making that change. The other big thing is just how the marketing messaging has changed. If you would ask me three years ago whether a cruise line or a hotel or a restaurant would want to have some statement on the landing page of the website about health protocols, I'd say not a chance. You know, you don't want people to be thinking about the possibility of getting sick when they travel. You know, you just put the fun stuff on the web page. You don't put this kind of stuff on the web page. It's just different, right? Now consumers need to trust the brand. So this is uh, this is a screenshot I just took today of the Royal Caribbean website, and you can see the stuff they have at the bottom where they explain. You know, we have 100% fresh filtered air. We pull the air in from the ocean. You know, it's not recycled air. They talk about the medical grade cleaning materials. They talk about what will happen if you get sick. They say we'll get you home. 
right? These are the things that they would never have put on the landing page of a website, never. And now they recognize that consumers need to trust hospitality brands and that's gotta be part of the marketing. So this is on the landing page of the website. Now it's not up at the top, right? It's down a little bit, but on a mobile device, you know, it's really easy to thumb scroll in and find this information. Jump to this really quick. I'm going to give you the last thing I want to talk about is in addition to trust, we still need to inspire people, right? To get people to go back. So for the last uh, 18 months, there's been very little marketing coming out of this industry and very little marketing in general for hospitality because people weren't traveling. So we're now starting to see marketing communications come back. But it's got a very specific message, right? And a lot of it is about inspiring people to travel again and to think about what they've been missing. I'm going to show this video. So I'm going to do a quick uh, stop share. And let's see if I actually, I don't think I need to stop. Let me see if I can get. All right, sound is shared. All right, I'm going to show you. This is a brand new commercial that Celebrity Cruises, which is a slightly higher end kind of sister brand with Royal Caribbean that they just introduced. And I want you to think about how the message has changed. And it's all about this idea of saying, isn't it time to get back out there? Isn't it time to travel again? So hopefully you'll be able to hear this okay. I see trees of green, no rubber, we can't. red roses too, I see them bloom for me and you, and I think to myself, oh what a wonderful world. Think about that message, right? It's trying to inspire people to travel again, but also saying we recognize that you're still concerned about your safety and your health. So it's interesting that this is this is the kind of message that this industry is is going out to market with. So we're finally seeing some marketing communications come back. All right, so that's what I have for you, and I'm going to offer it up to any questions that you may have. I know we kind of blasted through that sort of quickly, but it's interesting how, to me, it's been just fascinating watch this, watching this industry in such a short amount of time have to change everything that they were doing, right? And hopefully survive. I mean, they're sitting with some major debt burden right now while they try to get customers back on board ships. Thank you very much, Professor Kelly. Of course. Well, very, very interesting. And maybe I should begin with a question because I don't know what will be or what's your vision on, on, on the future of, like, of the cruise industry. Will it, it change? Uh, will, will these uh, security measures will keep up uh, in, in four years, in five years? And will destinations... Um, uh, I, I was very... It was very interesting how you said that before uh, some of the of the travelers want to interact with locals and now the, the probably how is this ex, this the cruise experience the final destination i don't know if, if you understand what i mean that if uh, that, that, like not going out of the cruise is uh we already saw that a little bit will it change uh the, the product you know, or the experience itself so it's, it, that's a good question. And I think we are seeing people still want to visit destinations. Like this is a product that 
one of the reasons people love it is the chance to visit multiple destinations in one trip, right? It's, and not have to unpack, you know, your hotel floats with you. That's the benefit is you can go and visit various destinations along the way. Um, people want to get back out and experience cultures. And, but one of the things that I think in the mass market cruise, so the big, big ships, we may see more of this, this uh, destination bubble, right? The hope, I think the promise, especially for, you know, Ecuador and, and destinations that are really rich in biodiversity and where you've got to be very careful. You don't want a 3000 passenger ship rolling up to the shore, right? At some destinations that are, that are pristine and that's okay. Um, Let them go somewhere else. But the growth of the industry and where we're seeing most of the growth is in the small ship segment, hundred passenger, 200 passenger luxury, right? The people want to, they don't want to be on these ginormous ships. They want to, to experience something um, much more authentic. So. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and that's the case of the Galapagos because as you know, the, the maximum passenger here, uh, the cruise are, is a hundred passengers. So, right. and, and, and most of them are luxurious. So that's uh, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, Noah, would you like to make a question? Yeah, I have a question about pricing. Like uh, how you, do you do uh, if you have 50% like, capacity? Uh, how you cover all these uh, expenses and if the prices for the uh, customers are higher or are like the same than before uh, that we had this 100% capacity? No, that's an excellent question. And an uh, excellent question. So one of the surprising things, this is that was announced um, and I, it actually surprised me and I thought I knew this industry pretty well, is that the new ships, newer ones, are profitable at a break-even occupancy of about 35%, 30 to between 30 and 40%, which is amazing. And that means that at regular pricing, if they've got 35 to 40% of the ship full, they can break even. So what we've actually seen so far in the industry with pricing is they've been able to maintain prices. Your question is a good one. Would they have to raise price if they're sailing only 50%? And they haven't. They've been able to keep the prices because they break even at a much lower number than I even thought. The other piece of this that's interesting is, unlike hotels, many hotels, is that cruise ships generate about a quarter of their revenue on board. Right? Mm -hmm. Keep the pricing down because people are spending a lot of money. Um, getting spa treatments and they're spending it at the bars and they're spending it on shore excursions. So if you can get people on board at a good price, the, around, around 25% of the revenue will come from onboard spending. So we have, they haven't had to raise price. It's a great question. Uh, Thank so you. Yeah, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I have a question regarding what you said before about making partnership with other companies. You said um, that uh, this company made a partnership with this one, but um, how does that make it profitable for both of them? <laughs> I mean, like, it's going to be hard for both, I know, but like money wise, but um, yeah, mainly how will they do it? Good question. It had nothing to do with profits. They weren't sharing in the revenue. What they were doing was sharing in the effort to try to get the entire industry working again, right? So it's interesting sometimes, and that's where like, uh, you know, if, if you have any familiarity with trade associations. So uh, a trade association often will have competitors that are all part of that association. But the role of the trade association is to promote the product overall. In other words, they promote cruising, not a specific brand. And this is the same thing that these two competitors who between them control you know, 50% of the market or something like that said, we just need to promote cruising because it's not helping that no one is taking your cruise right now. So by collaborating on sharing technology, and sharing medical information, if we can get more people 
back to cruising, it's going to benefit everybody. So it's one of those uh, rare times when you have fierce competitors that have said, you know what, it's about promoting our product of cruising and not worrying about the brands. So it had nothing to do with profitability. It was just, we got to get people buying cruises again. Good question. All right. So what I got is that, so both of them work together to like get up together and like cope with each other and try to like both of them grow. But don't, don't you think like that could create like in some sort of way, like a uh, competition, like <laughs> uh, we, I did this and then, all right, I'm gonna get this. And then, um, you know, we are both trying to get people, but, and we're both trying to grow the, like the, the business itself. Yep. But yeah. how do you control like the fact that I'll get this market or you will get this marketing specific? You know what I mean? Oh yeah, no, it's good. It's funny thing is I I watched I was part of a uh, of a conference that had the presidents of these two lines together, and they usually argue, they usually fight. Like <laughs> it's really funny. And this was one of the rare times that they were kind of saying, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna actually have to get along for a little while," but once. Once the industry's back up again, believe me, they at each other's. You know, <laughs> then the yeah. starts again. Absolutely, but they just realize that sometimes the bet, you know, doing right for the greater good is actually going to help. You know, it's it's by working together, we're going to help us individually. Because if we can't get people back on ships, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter if we're competing. Right. It's a great question. All right. Thank you. Of course, Lucia. So oh, hi, uh, first, it was an amazing uh, presentation. So thank Thanks. you so much. So my question is, uh, you talked about a new traveler who is aware of the environment. So how uh, how do you manage the footprint, the carbon footprint uh, in the cruise industry, knowing that it's an industry that always is, uh, you know, moving a lot of uh, stuff? So that's a fantastic question too. And you know what, we have to be honest, the cruise industry is not an environmentally, uh, it, it's, it's, it is a bad environmental footprint, right? And so um, the kind of fuel that it uses, and certainly if you've got three, 4,000 people getting off on a ship and they, they you know, crash a destination and all of a sudden there's all, the cruise industry has a long, as much as I love it, a long and really bad record when it comes to the environment, right? So the hope is though, that especially I look at you, I look at your faces, like, I mean, this sounds like something an old man would say, right? But the hope is with you guys saying, you know what, we're not gonna buy that product unless you reduce your environment. We wanna know what your environmental practices are. Like we wanna know that you're not using single use plastics anymore. We wanna know that your what your recycling plan is. We want to know how you work to to protect destinations. And if we don't if we don't buy it, we're not going to buy that ticket either, right? So younger consumers are making much more conscious choices about that. But the fact is, airlines cruises not good for the environment. They just aren't, right? And they've got to get better. So like some of the innovations that are happening, even in cruising, is the use of you know, LNG, liquefied natural gas, that doesn't pollute as much. Small steps, right? That's a very good question. I don't know if I answered your question. So somebody had a question, what was the most effective form of advertising in terms of reaching out uh, uh, to new customers? Okay. Yeah, so it depends. Right now, if in the cruise industry, it's certainly that industry, it's social media, big time. It's big time social media using influencers right if because I, I can't imagine that you guys are like the big cruise lines they don't do much television advertising anymore they just it's all digital right it's creating really cool videos that they post on youtube or they have on on their website right it's creating a killer website that's just really engaging um but a lot of it right now especially for new cruisers young cruisers it's all social media Right. That's where the big brands, that's where they're shifting all their spend right now is away from traditional print and magazines and television. And they're shifting it to digital because they know that's where you guys are. 
I hope that answered that question. I think it did. Um, thank you. Well, we have one last question uh, before letting you go. Sorry. Of course. Sorry, no, my you, pleasure. You, no, it was very yes. interesting. Um, I had a question. So do you think that back like post pandemic when everything gets back to normal, are cruises going back to certain islands, like not necessarily going to their private islands, but let's take for as an example, Royal Caribbean, they used to travel to the Bahamas, to Haiti, which they also had a private island Very and good. to other islands. Do you think they will be going back to these islands or staying only with their private islands? It's a great question. Um, they will be going back, but I think it's going to be less. Right. I think that they're going to rely more on those private islands. And the other crazy thing about this, just as kind of an interesting little fact that you might be surprising, yeah, the the guest satisfaction, you know, the guests always rate their scores on which which port of call they like the best. The one that rates the highest is the private island. Hmm. So so at least for that brand, you would think, uh, you know, so if they visit some of these other islands, but that's a mass market cruise brand. It's not necessarily somebody who's looking for something that's really authentic and nature bound and that would never want to go to uh, an island with a water park, right? But for Royal Caribbean, people like that private island the best. So they're probably going to rely on it more. But cruisers want to get back out and experience destinations. It's a very good question. Very interesting. So just one quick question. Uh, what's your personal favorite cruise? Uh, are you a cruise guy? A little yes, bit. I have to be. Are you kidding me? Of course. Of course. Well, yeah. that's a good example when you think about marketing. It depends on your target market. When I was younger and my children were younger, right? We really liked a Carnival Cruise Lines and Royal Caribbean. Great for kids. I'm now, I, my just sent my youngest is in college now. Oh, so wow. empty nester. So I'm all by myself, weeping all alone. My wife and I, it's a very sad Actually, it's not that bad. That's your parents <laughs> to get you off to school and they're like, we'll miss you. See ya. Don't come back soon. Um, then you start to enjoy the cruises that are a little uh, a little higher, more higher end, like celebrity. But I really want to do uh, an, an expedition cruise that's going to take me to where you are. So that's the next on my list is to come and cruise uh, the Galapagos. So we'll be waiting for you. January, right? You told me I have to be in there in January. Yes, but we will have like a, a small uh, hospitality summit, so uh, okay. you, you're going to have to work for a day at least. <laughs> That's fair enough. That's fair enough. <laughs> I would love it. And I'll get a chance to meet all of you in person. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Professor K. It has been very interesting and our students were very engaged uh, and we've learned a lot as always when speaking to you. So I am very grateful and thanks again for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. Of course, I wish you all well, and I hope to see you soon. Sure, and I have to give you some some chocolates and some things that we usually <laughs> give to our speakers here. Okay. But uh, when, when you come, they'll be waiting for you. Fantastic! All right, thank, thank you very so much. much. It's been a pleasure. All right, thank you very much. Ciao con thank todos. Que pasen bien. Nos vemos el viernes. No se olviden. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, thank you, you thank, you. thank you. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. So that was fun. It's a good group of kids.